if the only difference between going slow and going fast is that exactly the same things happen, but just later, if you're going slow, then it's fast, then you might think maybe it doesn't really matter so much. But um, if there are second order effects, then uh, the, the, the distribution of probable outcomes for humanity might be very different if you're going fast. Nick Bostrom is filosoof en directeur van het Future of Humanity Institute in Oxford. Hij vertelt in het komend kwartier over hyperintelligentie en zijn visie op de toekomst van de mensheid. Welkom bij Tegenlicht Talks. This is uh, where I sit. Not right now, obviously. It's empty, but uh, where well, I would be sitting if you weren't here. Just to start off, if um, we are in the Institute for the Future of Humanity. Whoever came up with the name? Well, I had to make it up at the spur of the moment because by the time it was clear that it was going to go ahead, we had to quickly select some name. And I played around with some different alternatives. But the only one that really spanned all the things that we wanted to do was this pompous, enormous name of the Future of Humanity Institute. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's, a huge, it's a huge name for a small institute, but it's actually quite descriptive of what we do. We really do try to look at the big picture questions for humanity and try to think about those in a careful way. So what we are interested in is not all aspects of the future, like next year's iPhone model or, or like how the cars will be slightly more energy efficient five years from now. We are interested in those questions that relate to whether the human condition could fundamentally change in some way, whether the fundamental parameters of human existence could change. Um, so one aspect of that is looking at extreme downsides, existential risks, threats to the very survival of intelligent life. Um, we're also looking at how uh, technology might make it possible to change human nature in some way through human enhancement technologies. And then we're interested in these methodological questions, like how is it actually possible to gain any insight into these topics? How can one do better than um, just express one's prejudices or, or engage in wishful thinking? How is it possible to study these things? As a species, yeah. Well, we are. Uh, we have the um, the pedal to the metal. We are accelerating ahead. Um, we're going faster and faster. Um, maybe not with very much foresight or very much of a plan as to where we want to end up, but we're going really fast and accelerating. Uh, the 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 distribution of probable outcomes for humanity might be very different if you're going fast, and. That is something that, that does worry me, that, that there might be these um, very powerful technologies that we will develop in this century. And we might not have very much lead time between when somebody gets the idea that it could be developed and when it's actually developed. There might not be very much time to reflect on how we can develop it safely. Um, so with technologies like artificial intelligence, for instance, to some extent, synthetic biology or nanotechnology as well. There seems to be extreme powers once you have reached a mature level of capability in those fields. But if we're going to go to that level within the course of decades or years, or in some scenarios, there might be a very sharp increase in capability, even in just um, days or weeks, then, then that kind of creates a, a very strange dynamics that, that we are not very good at coping with. So at the moment, there is no grand master plan for humanity, and that's good in many ways. But it also means that we don't have the ability, when there actually is some issue that requires a coordinated response, we don't have the ability as a species to try to figure out how to approach it, whether we should, say, postpone developing a particular technology until we have gained more wisdom. We don't have that, that ability. So all too often, I think, the future is used as a projection screen uh, on which we display our hopes and fears, or 
Um, we signal our ideological belongings by predicting a certain kind of future, uh, rather than the future being a topic where it's actually important to try to have factually correct beliefs. But if, if the future is not just a sort of a means for doing things in the present, but if the future is actually something where we would one day have to live, uh, then it's important to think about the future in a different way. It's not just a symbol of something, but it's like a topic that's really important that we need to study. Well, I'm currently writing a book on um, the future of artificial intelligence, uh, machine superintelligence. I think that's one of these really big issues that are mainly uh, off the radar at the moment. Like there, there are a few people thinking about it, but it's not really part of mainstream discussion in society. The, the idea that machines may one day equal and then surpass humans in general cognitive ability, not just skill at particular tasks. Um, so on the one hand, you have the, the path of replicating what biology has. So we have an example of a general intelligent system like the brain. Uh, it's a finite physical system. One can gradually learn more about how it works and maybe draw insights from that. What kind of computational architectures does the brain use to compute? What learning algorithms try to implement the same on computers? The, the extreme end of this approach would be whole brain emulation, where you would actually emulate a particular human brain by maybe first vitrifying it or freezing it and slicing it up in very thin slices and then scanning these slices and reconstructing the neuronal network in a computer. Um, on the other hand, we have more mathematical approaches to artificial intelligence, which don't try to mimic what the brain does. Um, and it's possible that that will get there much faster, that there might be some insights that will enable somebody to create artificial intelligence that doesn't particularly resemble human intelligence. But it will probably require uh, one or more likely a number of sort of fundamental theoretical advances. So it's hard to predict how long that will take. But I think both of these are sort of live candidates for the path that will lead us to, to general, general intelligent machines. The fact that there are multiple paths, of course, increases the chance that the, uh, the, the outcome will eventually uh, be reached. Well, so this is a conjecture rather than a firm claim. I call it, I think, the uh, technological completion conjecture. The idea that assuming that science and technology will continue to be allowed free reign, then eventually all important technologies that could be developed will be developed. Given that conjecture, if one accepts it as, a, as an assumption, one can then think about what are these technological capabilities that will be developed. And that's something we can study sometimes from first principles, um, using um, basic physical laws, computational modeling, we can study the properties of systems that we can't currently build. Um, so at one extreme, say with nanotechnology, we can run molecular simulations of little molecular systems that we can't put together, but we could see what would they actually do if we could put them together. And with this technological completion conjecture, you can then guess that maybe one day we will put them together and then this kind of capability will be in the hands of humans. Um, at the other extreme, you can think about space colonization and you can think about um, under various assumptions about travel speed and so forth, uh, what is the amount of resources that, that uh, the intelligent descendants of uh, the human species could one day acquire and use for some productive purpose. Um, and um, so this is one way to study some of these things is that it's sometimes much harder to predict what will happen in the nearer term than it is in the longer term. Uh -huh. So if I, if I try to predict whether you will be back uh, in the Netherlands, say, by 10 o'clock this evening, I have no idea, 50-50, I don't know when a train will leave, whether there will be delay. Uh, but if the question is, will you be back in the Netherlands by tomorrow night, I'm going to assign a much higher probability to that. And, and one week from now, I'm pretty sure you will be back in the Netherlands. So sometimes a longer time horizon makes it easier to predict. Um, so there is one concept which I think might be useful, 
which is that of a technologically mature civilization, let us say. That is one that has um, developed um, all of the fundamentally important technologies that can be developed. So we are not there yet because we can see that there are many possible technologies that we can currently create. But at some point, if science and technology continues, maybe we will reach this technological maturity where we're at or close to sort of the maximum technology. And that's a state that we can characterize by studying, say, some of the fundamental uh, physical limitations to what can be done. Uh, there's like the speed of light, there are thermodynamic limits to what you can do. We can study the performance of computational systems that we can create and uh, there might be other disciplines that throw in some constraints as well, uh, from economics and so forth. Um, and we can have some, some, some rough idea of at least a lower bound on the capabilities that a uh, technologically mature civilization would possess. There, there is a tendency to hype what's possible in the near term, I think, for obvious reasons, in that there is a lot of people who have a commercial interest, say, in making their own little product seem uh, more on the verge of a breakthrough than it actually is. Similarly, in academia, if you are working in a lab and you're creating a new robot, you want to make it sound as exciting as possible and that if you just give us this one more research grant, you know, we're going to produce something amazing. So there is this kind of hype cycle. Um, I think in the longer term, it's more that people don't really distinguish between the medium term and the long term very carefully it seems to me, that um, what's going to happen 20 years or 30 years from now and what's going to happen 100 years from now is like kind of, in many people's minds, those are just future and you can just make stuff up. Uh, whereas in reality, there might be a very large difference between, between those. So I'm not sure whether it's possible to say anything very interesting in general about whether people are too boosterish about the rate of change. Um, I think there are other more systematic distortions. I think that people might have a bias uh, of assigning too high probabilities to interesting uh, scenarios, interesting stories. So there are different ways of trying to understand the space of possibilities in the future. One is by looking at particular technologies or trends or, and kind of working out specific things. Another is to try to think more abstractly whether there are any overall constraints um, that we can place on the future based on indirect considerations. One indirect type of consideration is um, the Fermi paradox, the, the fact that we have not seen any signs of uh, extraterrestrial intelligence. So we know that there are all these planets out there but so far none that has managed to build spaceships to come here or send signals here. So that's kind of an interesting thing. And you can think it through and it imposes some constraints over what, what one can coherently believe about the likelihood of intelligence arising and traveling and risks and so forth. Another kind of indirect uh, consideration which I discovered is this simulation argument, um, which, try, which tries to show that one of three propositions is true. Well, it doesn't tell us which one. Um, and those three, three are, one is that almost all civilizations at our current stage of development go extinct before reaching technological maturity. That's one possibility. Uh, another, the second possibility is that there's a very strong convergence among all uh, technologically mature civilizations in that they all lose interest in creating um, what I call ancestor simulations. Ancestor simulation would be a very detailed computer simulation of people like their historical forebears. Detailed enough that the simulated people would be conscious. Um, and the third possibility is that we are almost certainly living in a computer simulation. And the simulation argument shows that if you, if you reject the first two of these possibilities, then you're sort of forced to accept the third one. So that shows then that you can't coherently reject all three. Um, yeah, so that, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think that there might be something lost maybe um, from the value of human existence if uh, we are not needed. 
Um, but that doesn't mean all value is lost. There are a lot of things that we do, not because they have cosmic meaning, but because we value them uh, for their own intrinsic purpose. So if you enjoy a nice cup of tea or a walk in the park or, a, um, or cuddling up with your, uh, with your girlfriend or something, that those things have a, they're, they're still have value, even, even if in the cosmic scheme they didn't matter, and even if somebody else could walk faster in the park or drink better tea or whatever. So it would maybe destroy some value, but not all. I don't place bets on the human species going extinct because I wouldn't be around to collect 